Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Great to see you here this evening. Uh, my name is Mike Brooks. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research here at the University of Adelaide. Can I first acknowledge the Ghana people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains and the land upon which the University of Adelaide's four campuses are built. So welcome everyone to the fourth of the University of Adelaide's 2014 Research Tuesday seminars, where we share research and knowledge uh, with the wider community. We all know that Australians love their beer, but many beer drinkers probably don't appreciate that uh, beer is typically made from barley. Uh, less people still probably appreciate that barley varieties from the University of Adelaide's barley breeding program accounts for over half of the 8 million tonnes of barley grown by Australia, Australian farmers each year. Tonight we're to hear from the leader of that barley program, Associate Professor Jason Eglinton. Jason was appointed as a plant breeder at the Wake campus at Urbre in 2000 and has led the barley program since 2003. Before that he completed his PhD in the bio biochemistry of malting quality and then led an international project improving drought tolerance in collaboration with the Global Agricultural Research Center, ICADA, in Syria. Today, under Jason's leadership, the University of Adelaide conducts one of the world's largest barley breeding programs with a field trial network of 100,000 test plots extending across Australia. The varieties produced are used in a range of markets, including domestic and international beer brands, as, uh, as we're going to hear today. So before I hand over to Jason, I'd also like to welcome very much Mr. John Meneses, our brewing manager at Cooper's Brewery, who is here tonight to talk about the partnership between Cooper's and the University of Adelaide. So please join me in welcoming Associate Professor Jason. Thank you very much, Mike. And thank you all for uh, taking some time out to uh, uh, hopefully learn a little bit about the university's role in, in supporting the Australian barley industry and increasingly the, the, the global beer industry. So what I'm hoping to do over the next little while is give you a, a, a range of information across, to give, a, I suppose, a general perspective about the challenges of uh, crop production in Australia, uh, the sorts of things that uh, uh, we focus on in terms of trying to improve, uh, genetically improve uh, our, our barley varieties, and also some of the market dynamics and market realities, where, where does our, our produce end up, and work through a series of actual commercial examples, so actual varieties that are in, in the marketplace now, to show you some of the technologies and some of the research perspectives that are used uh, to, to deliver on those objectives. So, first of all, barley production in Australia. Basically, it mirrors our broadacre uh, crop production, and so the, the map uh, shows on a strange scale uh, tons of barley per square kilometre. So, the darker the green, the more barley that's grown there. And essentially, that's the same uh, footprint, if you like, that wheat. Uh, canola and to a lesser extent some of our, our pulse crops and, and other smaller crops are grown. So across Australia wheat is the number one crop by volume, barley is number two. And you can see of course uh, South Australia features quite strongly uh, historically and currently as a major producer of uh, feed and malting barley. Barley is grown across temperate and Mediterranean climates throughout the world. Um, many environments perhaps more favourable than the Australian climate. As you'd all know, rainfall deficits and temperature extremes are, well I've said typical, certainly farmers would say common. Uh, it's not rare to talk to a farmer to say he's been waiting for 20 years to have an average season. It's up or it's down or it's uh, something is happening, it's never just average. Uh, so maps like this, uh, I guess, are common fare for the uh, international trade of barley where they're trying to decide if Australia is up or down or just what is it going to be able to supply. Despite, besides that, of course, our, our underlying environment uh, also has a fair few challenges. So typically across Australia, we, we have fairly ancient soils. Many of them derive from, uh, from ancient seabeds. And 
most of them not particularly generous. So uh, high pH soil types are very common, low amounts of topsoil. We have the rolling dune and swale sand dune systems common throughout South Australia and Northern Victoria. Um, the typical what they call dirt in Western Australia, but largely beach sand. We have a few places that have genuine generous soil, but not so many. And we have uh, frequency, high frequency of toxicities within these soils. So high levels of boron, high levels of salt. We have deficiencies of zinc, deficiencies of manganese. So a challenging um, environment for our plants, uh, a challenging environment for our farmers to, uh, uh, to manage their cropping systems in. And we also have a huge range as we move from uh, those summer dominant areas uh, in Queensland through to uh, the western districts of Victoria. We've got a big latitude shift, rainfall pattern shifts, and I guess to put it in context, uh, overall our average yield across the country is 2.1 tonnes per hectare. Compared to France at 7.6, or even our colleagues just over in New Zealand at 6.9 tonnes per hectare. So our agricultural system on an average basis is more similar to India and Syria uh, than it is to, I guess, uh, some of our, uh, our, our competing uh, countries in terms of broad acre agricultural production. The two pictures there uh, were taken on the same day, uh, albeit 500 kilometres apart. Uh, one in northern Victoria that was field trials that we ended up not harvesting but would have been maybe 200 kilograms per hectare of, of grain yield to the one below it in the Riverina of New South Wales uh, that the best, best test plots in that were almost 10 tonnes per hectare. So our objectives in terms of breeding can feel a little eclectic when you look at that, but essentially we're trying to come up with varieties that have adaptation across such a broad range of environments but key to it is the stability, the stability of yield, the stability of the agronomic performance, uh, whether it's geographic variation or seasonal variation that we're trying to deal with. So the, the key drivers of what new varieties are trying to address all come back to profit. Uh, and, and really the pinch point is profit at the farm gate, profitability for farms. Uh, it's no good having something that'll make lots of profit for a brewer because a farmer just won't grow it. So it has to work at that farm level. And from our side, there's really two angles, or, or two, two areas that we go into. Productivity, uh, obviously yield, the amount of productivity on the farm, and that is driven through the yield potential, but also factors that take away yield. So disease resistance, pest resistance, and resistance to abiotic stresses. Those things also influence the physical grain quality that can be produced and price is another key factor. So if we look at the long term average between uh, say feed barley versus malting barley, growers are receiving perhaps $40 a tonne uh, difference between those two, two commodities if they've got uh, the correct physical quality out of their crop. So how do, we, how do we achieve this? I wanted to avoid a genetics lecture or, or plant breeding 101, but I guess if there's things unclear, we can come back to in question time. But essentially, our process of plant breeding is the deliberate hybridisation of different varieties. So we, we effectively emasculate a plant, we take out the, the uh, anthers, allow the flowers to mature, and then physically add pollen from another plant to create cross-pollination. So barley and wheat, our other cereals, are self-pollinating species. So this is our process of artificial insemination uh, to essentially create new combinations of genes and traits that then the breeding process and selection process tries to evaluate and find what are the best, have we found any new combinations of those traits? Have we combined the preferred traits from those parents? So in not too dissimilar way as you could think about uh, someone breeding show dogs or breeding racehorses. They're trying to uh, combine the best combinations of selected parents. The difference is the sort of scale that we can do it on and the sort of genetic precision that we can apply. So we would make something like 400 different cross combinations per year, different combinations of different parents. And we would generate up to 20,000 
unique potential new varieties, so 20,000 brothers and sisters. And it's that sort of scale of, of material that we then evaluate uh, to really try and look for that, that next new variety. And in terms of the evaluation process, it takes in um, DNA-based testing methods. So although our work is based around conventional breeding, and, uh, and not GM approaches, there's still a huge amount of technology applied to our breeding and selection systems. So we use molecular markers to basically profile most of those plants to give us an idea what characteristics they've combined from the parents. Those that appear, at least uh, to the best of our genetic knowledge, to have the combinations that we're after, they can then start to go out into the field to be truly assessed in terms of their field performance their performance against a range of pest diseases and ultimately tested for their end use quality and their processing quality. So to give you an idea, this, this map uh, tries to show the range of our field testing locations. So we have some 34 sites spread from coast to coast. So these are trials that are grown on commercial farms using commercial farmers' principles and practices. Uh, we, as Mike said in the introduction, there's something like 100,000 test plots of, of barley uh, spread across those sites. And it generates a mountain of data and a, and a mountain of selections decisions. Essentially, a test plot's about the size of a dining room table. And we array, array an experiment in the field that seeks to compare the performance of different test lines. So that's an aerial shot of uh, one of our sites at the Roseworthy campus of the University of Adelaide. Uh, so to put it in context, there's a car and one of my breeding staff tells me he was not asleep in the car. He's somewhere in the paddock, but he's very, very hard to spot. So these are quite big so sites, quite large scale uh, breeding and evaluation programs. And that brute force genetics, uh, to some extent, is, is what's been, is one of the ways that we achieve improvements in grain yield. So. This is uh, a set of independent trial data that shows the long-term uh, grain yield performance, in this case, through the mid-north of South Australia, as an example, ranging from schooner, which is an old benchmark variety that we released in 1983, um, over time through to Sloop SA, perhaps the, we think the world's first variety developed and selected using DNA-based technology, uh, and that was in 2002 up to the current Australian dominant malting variety commander. So you can see that, that yield increase uh, over a relatively short space of time in response to genetic selection in the target environment. But we can also do quite elegant specific sort of uh, genetics approaches and physiological approaches to, to, to try and also improve adaptation and yield. And one of the strategies is to look at the wild relatives of barley as a source of novel and different variation that we haven't necessarily tested. So of course barley, wheat, all our other crops are not endemic to Australia. They were domesticated in North Africa, West Asia, and uh, after domestication uh, really were introduced into Australia as cultivated species or cultivated varieties. So there's this whole pool of genetic variation in the wild relatives that have never really been tested in the commercial context. And from an Australian production perspective, where we have a, a pretty dry, hostile climate, um, it's of obvious interest to go to places like Syria, which has definitely a dry and unfortunately hostile climate as well. And fortunate enough to spend some time there, and, and this is uh, a group of colleagues and I actually looking at plants, wild barley plants growing and uh, surviving on something like 65 millimetres of rainfall in a year. Uh, so that's equivalent to, or less than, perhaps Alice Springs. Um, so really well adapted to these sort of environments. So it's, it begs the obvious question, are there some genes in there that we could use to improve the performance of our varieties here in Australia? The problem is when we take that sort of material and bring it into a slightly more productive situation, in this case, they're just growing in a glass house. These poor wild barleys, I'd never seen anything like it, so they've gorged on it, and they're six feet tall, fall over, uh, it's a disaster. They're really out of, their, out of their ideal situation. So 
these are just too wild for us to actually test. We can't grow them in the Australian production environment and, and expect to see anything like commercial agronomic performance. So we have to use some genetic approaches to then try and interrogate these wild barleys to see if there is something there of, of use, but we have to tame them down a bit first. So we used a, quite an elaborate strategy, and in fact the first time it was ever applied to, to a, uh, a cereal called Advanced Backcross QTL Analysis. And so very briefly, we, we took our, our wild barley, we did that physical crossing, physical cross-pollination to, in this case, one of our uh, well-adapted feed barley varieties. And from the progeny, we created a big family and crossed each of those back to our feed barley again and back to our feed barley again. At the end of that, we took our, our collection of sister lines, went through a tissue culture uh, process to create doubled haploids, which meant each new line is genetically homozygous, so genetically pure and stable, to give us a final population of 325 breeding lines, which are trying to be illustrated by, by the cartoons here, where they are pretty much the feed barley genome. So maybe 95% of their genome is our feed barley variety, but they just have a small segment from the wild barley or in a small but different segment. So of course we can take all of those 325, interrogate their molecular composition, look at their DNA profiles. And so in this case arrayed from top to bottom are those 325 individuals. From left to right, the seven chromosomes of barley. And red designates our feed barley varieties uh, alleles, its genetic composition, and the blue a wild barley segment. So you can see we end up with a collection of a collection of lines that are predominantly like our feed barley, but they've each got a little bit of wild barley in them. And we can use this as the platform to then test if any of those pieces of the genome from the wild barley have something useful to contribute. And when we grow those out in the field, this is what we would ho we'd hope would happen. These are individual breeding plots, and it's very difficult to see them being different from each other. And that's the hope. They're not all over the place. None of them look like that wild barley that's going to fall over. They all look like commercial barley. And they're therefore similar enough and are going to perform uh, similar enough that we'll be able to detect any advantages from those small segments of wild barley. So we took that population, grew it across a series of low rainfall environments through Western Australia through to New South Wales and internationally. And the genetic analysis showed us there was one particular region on the long arm of chromosome 2H that was, that was always associated with improved grain yield and improved grain size when you had the wild barley alleles at that location. So we were then straight away able to say, okay, there is something useful here and uh, we want to take this, cross it with our very, very best breeding material Understanding that genetic layout, we can then use molecular markers to specifically tar target that region. So here we're symbolising the, uh, uh, in green, the wild barley gene. Or not gene, a genomic region. I guess the gene itself remains at this point still elusive to us. We're talking about a piece of the genome. So there could be maybe 150 genes in there. We don't really know what any of them do. Uh, well, we know some of them, some of them have got names, some of them have got sequence, we know a little bit, but we don't really know which of those is responsible for this outcome. But from a pragmatic plant breeding point of view, from the point of view of trying to deliver a variety to farmers, we don't need to know that yet. We can do that research in the background in the meantime, but we can still move forward in terms of producing a variety with improved agronomic performance. And so ultimately out of, out of this crossing and DNA-based selection strategy, we, we had a, a breeding line, WI4483, everything gets a breeding code number, and that had the correct composition. And that became one of our, our key breeding lines that was evaluated very broadly across the nation and was given the name Fathom. So this is a set of yield data, now over a pretty long term, 22 sites, each year, 
These numbers are expressed as a percentage of our old benchmark variety schooner. So we have three of the dominant feed barley varieties, Fleet, Hindmarsh, Keel. You can see uh, much higher grain yield than schooner, 20% or so. And Fathom's grain yield. So in 2008, 9, 10, 11, significantly higher yield than the current benchmark varieties. Murphy's Law, when we released the variety to farmers, well, that was the year for some reason it, uh, it didn't quite match the leading varieties, but uh, pleasantly last year it was back to, back to its, its normal performance. So Fathom is actually now set to replace uh, Fleet. Fleet is the largest feed barley variety by volume grown in Australia, uh, in South Australia. And, uh, and so we have, I guess, one of the very few examples of where we've been able to use uh, wild barley uh, to do genetic analysis of yield and adaptation and then generate a new commercial variety that is uh, being strong, strongly adopted by farmers. So before we went through that example, I was talking about the brute force genetics of a large breeding program with massive population sizes and evaluation in the target environment. That's the sort of breeding that's given us um, Commander, the current, Australia's current dominant malting variety, Hindmarsh, which is a food variety and again very popular, and Fathom, we've just been through its leading agronomic performance. In this case, we have a set of yield data uh, analysed over six years, um, breaking up the different regions of South Australia. So essentially, they're the three varieties that farmers are contemplating. Am I growing this one or that one? There are some others, but these are the market leaders in terms of agronomic performance. And our newest variety uh, that we haven't yet released, but is in large scale commercial seed production, is called Compass. And these numbers are expressed as a percentage of the mean of all the varieties that were in the trial. So you can see Fathom, 18% above the average in the trial for Upper Air Peninsula, Compass, significantly higher, significantly higher, significantly higher. So I guess for us, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll show you some reasons why, these continued advances in productivity are absolutely critical to driving uh, on-farm productivity and moving our industry forward. Besides actually producing the grain, as I said, quality, um, having something that's marketable to sell is another key uh, component. And from the farmer's side of the equation, the first thing they see about quality is when they aim to deliver it at the silo. And when it goes into that, that industrial system, one of the key things that tends to, uh, to downgrade barley from that malting premium worth about 40 bucks a tonne down to a feed grade is the size of the grain, um, which is one measure of is uh, the percent of the grain that is above 2.5 millimetres. Our old friend Schooner, just above that black line at 70%, which is the standard, industry standard malting limit. So if you're above 70%, uh, you're in line for the $40 a tonne premium. Uh, a bunch of other malting varieties there in blue, struggling with that bar, particularly in, in this data set from 2012. Uh, Commander showing another reason why it's one of the dominant ones. In yellow, our feed varieties tend to be very strong agronomically, robust sort of grain size, but in, in green, uh, compass, I guess, setting the new, new benchmark for malting alternatives. So this is a variety I, I guess we've got, the farming community is pretty excited about and, and looking forward to in terms of driving the next stage of yield advance. So if we're doing all these good things about improving the performance, the agronomic performance of individual barley varieties as they're released, we would hope to see national production increasing. And so this is the ABARES uh, values for the last 43 years. And a bit like uh, the rainfall deficit map, it's going to go up and down depending on droughts and the nature of the season. Um, but from just under 2 million tonnes to above 8 million tonnes, we've seen quite impressive growth over that period uh, in total productivity. But of course, rainfall's not increasing. Um, now, I'm not going to give um, 
environmental description of, of our production environments, but uh, uh, for those of you sceptical about uh, climate change and outlook, um, you can pull up just about any uh, Bureau of Meteorolo Meteorology uh, site. And in this case, I've pulled out Crystal Brook from the mid-north, but uh, this is the sort of pattern you'll typically see. Um, you can argue about the statistical scale of how much it's gone down, but certainly it's not going up. So when we look at actual on-farm grain yield in tonnes per hectare, we can be fairly satisfied that our farming systems, the approaches farmers take to how they grow their crop, and the new varieties themselves are driving improvements in water use efficiency and driving improvements in uh, productivity despite that environmental variability and downward shift in growing season rainfall. So again, uh, drought years uh, are a pretty standout feature, but pretty consistent, excluding those years, pretty consistent increase over time, tracking at about 2.7% per annum increase in on-farm uh, productivity. So, of course, all breeding programs, whatever their nature, whether they're, they're a high-tech sort of breeding program like we run at the University of Adelaide where we're really trying to integrate all of the research tools that we have in the plant sciences with breeding or if they're, they're more uh, uh, based on seed production type principles, all trying to achieve increases in grain yield and of course we have a battle for area. The farmer can say, well, I'm going to grow wheat, or I'm going to grow barley, canola, so on. Um, now wheat and barley are probably the two most interchangeable crops in Australian farming systems. So we like to benchmark our genetic progress in barley against wheat. Uh, we also like to have a friendly rivalry with our private sector wheat breeding colleagues just to keep them on their toes. So I've taken the ABES data for um, wheat yield for the last 43 years and express the barley yield for that year as a function of the wheat yield. So what this tells you is that uh, from 1970 to the early 1980s, the average farmer in Australia was achieving 5% higher grain yield from their wheat crop than they were for their barley crop. As we then moved through the 1980s, there were some really important variety releases. So schooner was one of them that I mentioned. Galleon was another major variety from the weight at that time that went on to dominate barley production. And certainly that drove that curve up. And so from, from the 80s through to early 90s, farmers were on average across the country achieving 5% higher yield for their barley than their wheat. Then the wheat breeders perhaps fought back a bit, and we spent a period of time where the two crops essentially are on parity. And that was actually a pretty important point in time because that's when some really large-scale investments and some strategic decisions were made about changing the way the University of Adelaide's barley program operated to add, uh, I guess, the first beginnings of DNA-based breeding technologies. Um, the first use of doubled haploid breeding technologies and a range of other acceleration strategies. Typically it took maybe 14 to 16 years to breed a new malting barley variety up to that point in time. Um, we got it down to about eight years now. Uh, so a lot of technology and a lot of investment was made. And I guess I'd like to, uh, like to propose that that response we've seen since then has largely been a function of that, those new technologies and adoption of different systems um, and research outcomes from our more basic science into our breeding strategies. So right now, uh, across the nation, farmers are essentially expecting 11% higher yield from their barley than from their wheat. Uh, pleasantly in South Australia, the ratio is even higher. Um, I guess uh, we probably have a larger influence on, on the barley industry here. Okay, so we're able to grow a lot of barley. We're, we're increasing our productivity, but of course we have to sell it. And the marketability is, is, is an important thing. Now, barley is used for lots of different things. It's a really important animal feed. Uh, it's the key ingredient in your Milo, it's in probably, there's malt extract in most of your breakfast cereals or, or breakfast bars and a whole bunch of other things that you wouldn't realise. But of course, we all relate barley to beer. So, uh, 
we'll have a quick chat about some things about beer. So ABS uh, reports uh, on, on a pure alcohol consumption basis. Um, per capita to them means anyone above 15. Not sure why it's not 18, but 15. So the blue line is, is national uh, consumption of pure alcohol. And through the 70s, there was a significant rise, but latterly, it's pretty stable at 10 litres per person equivalent. The red line is, is alcohol in the form of beer. And again, early 70s was the peak and a pretty significant and uh, stable decline in terms of the amount of alcohol consumed by Australians uh, in the form of beer. But that doesn't completely relate to volume because, of course, in 1973, uh, you would have got some funny looks drinking a light beer. Mid-strength beer even didn't exist. So we've seen a change in the, in the patterns of beer and the, and the beer styles over that time as well. But certainly an increase in wine, very significant increase in wine, lesser increase in spirits, and there are a few younger people in here that are perhaps responsible for this new blip in cider. So, okay, it's going down a bit, but don't go feeling too sorry for our big brewers. Um, they're going okay. Uh, if we look at uh, Australian brewing industry annual revenue since 04, it's, it's, it's tracking along at about 2.2% growth per annum and worth, well, getting towards $5 billion per annum. So, so they're, they're doing okay. And, and I suppose there's this emerging view that, that we as a community are approaching a position more where two beers that you really like is worth paying a bit more for compared to historically maybe having a six pack of rubbish that just gave you a headache. And that's sort of the trend, perhaps, in terms of quality versus volume. So on the world league ladder, we still drink a fair bit of beer. Um, liters, again, liters of beer per person, above 15. Czech Republic, undisputed world champions, up there at 140 odd liters per person. Um, Australia, not in danger of challenging them, but in the top group in terms of drinking beer big volumes. In contrast, China, only about 25 litres per person. So Australia's, you know, Australians are putting in a good effort in terms of supporting our, our local barley industry. But given all that, collectively, we only drink about 200,000 tonnes worth of barley. We grow 8 million tonnes. So as important as the Australian brewing industry is, we also be, have to be very mindful of the global um, beer brewing industry as that re represents a key market. So if we look at beer production by country, Australia made the top stakes in terms of how much we drink per person, but we don't make the top 25 in terms of our national brewing capacity. China per person was very low but it has rapidly overtaken the US in terms of its total beer market, total beer uh, production. I've coloured in yellow some interesting ones, Japan, Vietnam, Thailand, South Korea. Um, key important export markets for, for malt from Australia, um, particularly Vietnam and, and, and Thailand, sustained growth rates of something like seven to eight percent per annum. So really strong market demand emerging out of those countries. And I guess we hear a lot about the, the, the Asian dining boom and, and what the demand will be. In the context of barley and malt and beer, that, that, that's already here. China is by far the biggest importer um, of, uh, of barley and user of malt in the world. But of course, those of you that have tried beers from some of those different places will appreciate how different some of those styles actually are. And they use different brewing processes. Typically in Australia, we use sugar as an adjunct. Uh, in China and Japan, other Asian countries, they'll use rice as an adjunct. That actually requires the enzymes that are present in barley to break down that rice into fermentable sugars that then yeast uses to produce ethanol. So you need something quite different in terms of the enzyme profile for those particular brewing styles to what we would use to make a VB. To put in context, those of you, there must be a couple that are home brewers, 
if you were to put the wrong one in the wrong one, so if we used a high fermentability malting barley and, and used it to try and make VB, it would be the equivalent of you doubling up the sugar, overflowing uh, out of control fermentation, bursting bottles and making a mess, which is no fun in your back shed, but on a commercial industrial scale, even less fun. So we were able to do some fundamental biochemistry to understand one of the key enzymes present in barley it actually occurs in a couple of different forms uh, when we look at barley from around the world. And there are a couple of individual amino acids that can vary. And depending on which form of this the barley has, we get a difference in the heat stability of that enzyme. And so we're now actually able to tailor, to some extent, our varieties to suit Australian brewing styles versus international brewing styles based on our knowledge of the beta amylase enzyme. Taking that market sort of market focus a step further um, has been a collaboration that we've had with Sapporo Breweries. And in this case, they were particularly interested in an enzyme called lipoxygenase, which acts on a series of fatty acids to produce two fairly interesting compounds. One trans 2 nonanol is responsible for a cardboard-like flat, stale, off flavour that can appear in beer over time. So it's a, a function of storage and particularly a function of storage at elevated temperature. And the second of these compounds has a negative effect on the beer foam. So the interest from Sapporo was, well, what if we could have a defective version of that enzyme? And they went off and surveyed all sorts of land races and different barley and came up, eventually found something that had effectively a, a, a defective enzyme. We were able to go in and sequence that particular gene and find that in, in this land race barley, there was a mutation that caused that gene to be not expressed. It had a stop code on inserted in the open reading frame. We were able to use that diagnostic DNA information to cross that into our existing variety flagship and then test the lipoxygenase activity. So this is normal flagship. This is with the defective gene. Uh, sorry, this is with the defective gene. So significant changes in this activity of this uh, target enzyme. Grew that on a commercial scale. On the left is Southern Star. On the right is Flagship. Uh, exactly one row apart. So farmers, of course, using GPS technology with two centimetre precision auto steer, so they know exactly which is which and where the border is. The beer made from that was then um, uh, tested with the Sapporo taste panel using uh, forced ageing and standard ageing techniques to show that the uh, beer made with a conventional variety, um, for instance, stored at 30 degrees for one month, uh, had a much higher total staleness or detection of those off flavours than the, uh, the new variety called Southern Star. So that's entering commercial production now. And uh, if you go out and uh, in future buy a, a Sapporo premium lager, uh, it ideally will have been grown on probably York Peninsula, malted by Joe White Maltings at either Cavan or Port Adelaide, brewed under licence at Regency Park by Coopers to the recipe of Sapporo, and your beer will stay fresh for longer. I'm sure none of you leave beer sitting around long enough to go stale. This is an issue more so, I guess, in the distribution transportation side of the equation. So what are we up to next? Uh, just a glimpse into the future. The Grains Research and Development Corporation has surveyed farmers for the last two years and the single number one rated issue that, uh, that they have across southern Australia and western Australia is spring radiation frost. So where we get a, a minus two event in early September and typically our, our plants in the field, our crops, be they wheat or barley, are flowering at that point, very sensitive to those temperatures and we get this intermittent floret sterility, can lose 70% of the grain yield. So we've established some platform technologies at the University of Adelaide that will allow now some serious work to go, to go into this. And GRDC are looking to invest something like $12 million a year over the next eight years to support the use of that technology and those platforms to see if we can uh, make some serious advances against this trait. 
I'd like to finish off by thanking some of the key uh, companies that we interact with. Um, many of them are important members of the value chain in terms of working together. Many of them are also major investors in the breeding program or our allied research. And some of them in the room, so very nice to see. Uh, oops, very nice to see. Of course, we've got John from Coopers and, uh, and a group from Joe White Maltings. And of course, my own team, um, they're responsible for essentially the, uh, the outputs that you've seen. I'm really just the one that gets to present it. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And we now have uh, a few minutes for John to give, I guess, uh, a commercial perspective uh, of the Australian industry. Um, so we'll hold question time and hand over to John. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Jason. So I just want to finish off Jason's talk to uh, give you a bit of a, a brief overview in terms of the Brewer's perspective, uh, in terms of how the work of Jason ends up in terms of uh, producing good quality beers. I'm just going to bring up my slide. Okay, for those of you who are not very familiar, this is our new uh, brewery at Regency Park. Um, we're proud to say that today is our 150, 152nd birthday, so uh, I might have a few beers afterwards uh, to celebrate that. Uh, we moved over to uh, Regency Park in uh, 2001, so after spending a number of years at Leabrook. So this is now a state-of-the-art brewery uh, with fully automated, so we're quite proud to, um, to uh, uh, tell you a little bit about that. So we're also proud that you know, we're, all, we're the only Australian-owned brewery. Um, our, our friends are primarily owned by overseas uh, companies like SAB Miller and um, Lion Nathan, i.e. Kieran. Uh, we're about 4.5% of the uh, national market. And Tim Cooper says, by the time he retires, he'd like to aim for about 6.5%. So we've got, our, we've got our work cut up for us. So I'm going to use this photo as a canvas for my presentation to, uh, to run you through in terms of the work that Jason does for producing uh, new barley varieties and the processes involved in terms of how we take that barley variety and, and use it to make uh, good quality beers. I'd just like to show you this slide because there's a fairly rigorous process in terms of uh, using a particular barley variety for uh, making up beer. So not all barley varieties ends up uh, suitable for making good beer. So this is a, um, a flow diagram that I uh, use from uh, Barley Australia website. Just shows you uh, schematically in terms of the accreditation process for picking up a particular barley which is uh, uh, tested, uh, uh, which is you know, suitable for brewing purposes. So in Australia, barley accreditation is uh, managed by Barley Australia in conjunction with the uh, Malting and Brewing Industry Barley Technical Committee. So it's a bit of a mouthful, but I'll just refer to them as the MBI BTC. So the NBI BTC is a, an independent committee made out of uh, technical experts of uh, maltsters and brewers uh, within Australia. Uh, so they are responsible for actually coordinating and evaluating a particular uh, new variety of barley, which uh, could be potentially used for uh, malting and brewing purposes. So uh, briefly, the, um, uh, the accreditation process is, is actually carried out over uh, two seasons, but not necessarily consecutively. So the particular barley variety has to be able to be commercially malted to a, a specification and also being able to be brewed and make satisfactory beer with it. So if the, if the barley is actually uh, past the, uh, the malting uh, trials and the brewing trials in stage one, it's actually repeated the following year in stage two to get some reliability of results and repeatability of results. And then the MBI BTC can then assess that uh, information and recommend to Barley Australia whether to approve that particular barley variety for malting and brewing or otherwise um, use it for something else like feed barley. So this is just like a, a, a timeline in terms of the uh, uh, accredited malting varieties that we have used in the past, going back since 1980s, early 1980s to, uh, uh, to uh, 2012. Prior to the 1980s, there's only one particular variety that was available to brewers, which is Clipper. But since then, uh, there's currently about 17 uh, commercially accredited malting varieties that brewers can use. 
So the ones I've got in red are the ones that Cubis have used uh, 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 previously and currently. So we were using Schooner back in the early 1980s. Uh, then we went to Sloop. Gedna is what we've been using uh, up until recently, until Jason uh, came out with a very good variety like Commander. Uh, and it's, you know, you could probably say that over the period of uh, early 1980s to currently where we are now, there's been a, a fairly significant improvement in terms of the quality of the uh, malting varieties for brewing purposes. Navigator is an interesting one because it's a thin husk variety and we like to get hold, to get uh, hold more of this particular variety because it's a thin husk variety but it's actually high in extract yield which is very suitable for producing our malt extract and home brew. So, we're not only renowned for brewing ales and stouts, but we're actually quite a big player in terms of producing homebrew extracts and malt extracts. Malt extracts produced uh, you know, in other uh, food uh, and beverage companies like Mars and Kellogg's and so forth. Navigator, because of, of the thin husk, gives you a, a, an extract of something like 83% plus, whereby Commander probably hovers between 80 to 81%. And as mentioned before, Australia typically averages about 8 million uh, tonnes of barley, uh, but can go down to 4 million in um, drought conditions and as high as 10 million in, in good conditions. But just over 32% 30, of that is actually used for um, uh, uh, malting purposes. So 2.5 million is available for malting, of which domestically about 200,000 tons is uh, used by uh, brewers in Australia and about uh, 0.85 million tons um, uh, exported overseas and the rest are exported as raw barley for malting uh, 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 elsewhere. Whoops. Let's go back to this one here. Okay. Now, to make good beer, there's actually a process involved prior to the brewing process, and we rely on our friends from uh, the malting uh, industry to actually uh, convert that barley uh, suitable for brewing purposes. So this is a, a fairly... Oh, can you... Okay, get this one. Oh, yeah. Hello. Yeah. So this is a fairly simplistic schematic uh, representation in terms of what happens per, uh, first before we get the, uh, the, uh, the malt for brewing purposes. So... You know, it's, like, it's a three, three key steps in the malting process. The first one is a steeping process, whereby the barley is actually uh, soaked in water for a period of nearly 24 hours to get the moisture up. What the maltsters then do is allow it to, uh, to germinate for a period of four to five days and allow the grain to grow. And the idea uh, with the germination is actually to actually uh, hydrolyze or um, uh, uh, free up the starchy endosperm, uh, so that's more amenable for us to extract the, uh, the fermentable sugars. And the third key step is the kilning process where they just drive off the, moist the moisture to less than 5%. Uh, I've got a slide here that I found on internet today that gives you a good representation in terms of what the germination is uh, supposed to be doing. So these are uh, starch granules which are embedded in the protein matrix. So the germination process actually allows a breakdown of those particular protein matrices that frees up the starch granules for us to extract the, the fermentable sugars. Okay, uh, to make good beer, uh, we need to have a fairly tight malt specifications. And that's basically to do with consistency uh, of our product. So the beer range that you see here, the sparkling ale, all the naturally conditioned beers, and including the lagers, actually use the same malt to, to produce from. So, but we do ask our uh, friends from the malting to actually uh, stick to a fairly tight uh, uh, malt specification for us to be able to consistently make uh, good beer. Just to uh, highlight a few things like uh, percent extracts is important for us in terms of getting the yield out of the, of the malt uh, colour. Uh, diastatic power is a measure in terms of the enzymes within the malt to actually convert the starch to fermentable sugars. Total protein is another important parameter for um, uh, head retention and uh, free amino nitrogen uh, is important for nutrients for the yeast during fermentation. So I won't go through that, but just to say that, you know, we do ask our friends from the malting to actually provide good malt for us to, to, uh, to brew uh, good beer with. 
Uh, just a little bit more data. So uh, on the last financial year, 2012-2013, we actually did something like uh, 1,700 uh, brews, and that's using about 15,000 uh, metric tons of malt. And the breakdown in terms of beer and extract is that you know we're just uh, producing 54% beer and 46%. Uh, extract. It never used to be like that. Uh, about 10 to 15 years ago, so it's, it's actually in favour of the extracts rather than beer. So the thought of actually moving to the new region society is actually to uh, keep up the mind with our homebrew and malt extract. But in fact, the beer side has taken over and it's nearly, or well, it's actually, you know, a lot more uh, brewing that we do these days compared to the extract brews. Uh, just to share a little bit more information, so out of those beers, uh, beer brews that we produce, our pale ale is still the number one uh, uh, volume that we produce, around about 15, uh, 59%, and that's uh, followed uh, second by sparkling ale, mild ale, and this low carbohydrate tankly that we produced, uh, or we launched about uh, four years ago. Uh, Mike mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, you know, Cooper's involvement in terms of research initiatives. Uh, we're fairly active in terms of supporting uh, research uh, to do with the uh, malting and, and uh, brewing industry. And this is just a list of the uh, uh, research initiatives that uh, we have done over the years. So in 1998, we actually sponsored a PhD student to, uh, to look into the uh, uh, characterizing the carbohydrate metabolism of uh, by industrial strains. So that's looking at distillers yeast, uh, brewers yeast, bakers yeast, um, and wine yeast, and then comparing that to, uh, to a, a lab strain in terms of its capability to uh, ferment uh, wort sugars. And we're glad to, uh, to tell you that uh, out of that uh, research, we're able to generate or breed a high performance home brew strain that so we actually uh, supply to home brew uh, enthusiasts uh, out there in the trade. We then sponsored a, a master's student to actually carry on that uh, previous uh, research by exploiting uh, noble yeast attributes, uh, attributes to produce um, efficient maltose utilizing strains. Maltose is the predominant uh, sugar in wort, so uh, it's something like uh, greater than 50% of the total sugars, fermentable sugar. So we'd like to be able to uh, come up with a strain that can utilize that uh, abundant sugar during fermentation. And also screening and identifying strains that um, has got the capacity to uh, not produce acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is a, a flavor compound that most brewers don't like to have in their beers because it's got that sort of apple cider type of character. Uh, so these two projects are actually carried out at, at the University of Adelaide at the Wade campus. But we also uh, collaborated with other universities like University of Tasmania where we actually uh, looked at optimising our boiling process to, um, uh, to make sure that uh, beer uh, uh, foam positive proteins like LPT1 and protein Z4 remain within the word to give us a good quality foam because there's nothing like a, a good beer with a, 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 a very thick, creamy head on top. And then recently we've been talking to uh, people from the, uh, the photonics and advanced sensing uh, and uh, would like to uh, use their technology for identifying um, uh, beer spoilage organisms in our, in our brewery. So that's my last slide, uh, just to give you an overview in terms of what uh, Cooper's involvements are within the industry. And I guess just to finish off, uh, this is the current custodian of the, the business. So this is the, the family directors, uh, Tim Cooper, our managing director, his sister Melanie, which is looking after corporate affairs, camp is, and Glenn Cooper is looking at the uh, premium beverages, which is our distribution of our beers outside of South Australia and Northern Territory. So I'll now hand you back to Jason to, uh, uh, if you have any questions for his uh, presentation. I'm quite happy to answer any questions as well. No takers for question time. So is feed barley just part of the development the malting standard or are there distinct varieties across the group? Okay, so yes and no. So obviously when the, the question was, is feed barley just downgraded malting barley or is it, is, are there some distinct differences? 
So yes, when a malting barley variety is downgraded, when a farmer falls out of that very narrow grain protein range, so nominally 9 to 12 per cent, it becomes feed barley. If the grain size is too small, it becomes feed barley. But having said that, South Australian farmers grow about 40% of their area is sown to dedicated feed barley varieties. So these are varieties that wouldn't matter how good Joe White Maltings were or Coopers were, they could not efficiently make beer out of it. So on John's specifications, you saw there was a limit of malt extract requirement was 80.5%. If you took our South Australian farmers feed barley varieties like Keel, Fleet, Bark, Fathom, they would achieve about 75% malt extract. So John would lose a quarter of his beer production just by using the wrong variety. And it would probably gum up every filter in the brewery. So there are quite a lot of differences between malting varieties and feed varieties. At the back. Okay, so the, the, the question was to finalise our research outcomes, do we need field trials or can we mimic those sorts of conditions in controlled environments? And I guess at the weight, we're very fortunate. We have some amazing infrastructure in terms of automated glass houses, a uh, big system called the, the plant accelerator, um, uh, where we can do some quite sophisticated things in controlled environments. But the reality is there are vagaries in the real production environment that we don't fully understand. So to really look at, at, at the commercial production, commercial potential of, of new varieties, they have to be tested in farmers' real fields. They have to be tested using the sorts of management, agronomic management principles that they would use. So that's why every year we run 34 different locations, so 34 commercial farmers' fields, that we are crash testing our potential new varieties and our research outcomes in, in that target environment. And we really rely on that for, uh, for decision making. Who names the varieties and how? <laughs> the question was who names the varieties and how? Uh, so uh, David Sparrow was uh, our first barley breeder at the University of Adelaide and he was, a, I guess, a bit of a sailing buff. Uh, and also a historian, so sailing ships were a key part of the barley trade, grain trade, and uh, responsible for obviously our export of, of the crop. So his first variety was called Clipper. Uh, the second big variety, Schooner, it's not named after a beer glass, it's named after the sailing ship. And really that set the tone for the theme. Now strictly it was sailing ships. Um, he accused me of being a heathen because I kind of deviated a little bit and kept the nautical theme, but I felt we'd run out of sailing ships. But So flagship, commander, etc. cetera, we're, we're keeping the nautical theme. And in terms of who gets to choose, uh, that would be me. <laughs> uh, in front. I was interested in the comparison between wheat and barley as, uh, as to um, yield per hectare, and the way in which barley now exceeds um, wheat in that respect. <laughs> I'd be equally, if not more, interested to learn about the comparative value per hectare of the yield um, in dollar terms. Forget about what the costs are for the meantime. Is it possible uh, to tell us that? Sounds like a retired farmer. He's, he's interested in the profit, not productivity. That's exactly the right question. So again, there are grade spreads in wheat like there are in barley, but if we assume you're growing the top top performing wheat variety in South Australia, or actually in pretty much all of Australia, is currently mace. It, mace has a highest, accredit, uh, highest uh, quality type of AH. If you compared that head to head with Commander, you would expect the AH wheat price to be around about 6 to 7% higher than the malt one barley price. So if we're averaging 10% higher yield for barley, but 7 or 8% lower price on a tonnage basis, there's not a lot in it in terms of profit return difference. So to make barley way more interesting to farmers, uh, we have to keep that margin ahead of wheat. 
if they come down to parity, so those times when wheat and barley the same yield, wheat's worth more. Is that, is that input factors are actually cheaper for barley production. Correct. And uh, so the, where margins are concerned, you optimise margin of physical product. In that case, in favour of growing barley over wheat in a, a mean year. So all years are mean in different ways. <laughs> That's true. Yes, there's a lot of factors. There's there's freight differentials as well because they've got different bulk densities. It's a complex equation, but uh, uh, it's a contest that we're in, I suppose, to, to keep barley of interest. So, uh, sorry, behind you, there was a question. Why? When I go and buy barley to put in my soup, what kind of barley am I buying? Ah. Um, Difficult to tell because it's been pearled, so you're now looking at uh, at a grain that's had perhaps the outer 20, 25 percent uh, milled off it. Um, but most likely, most likely it would be would be feed barley, and that's actually a good thing because all the negative things I said about a feed barley not working for John at Cooper's, many of those are because they're much much higher in beta glucan which in a soup is probably not a bad thing. May I ask another question? How much? Oh, uh, just I behind you, please. This was a very uh, fascinating presentation by both of you. Could you please say something about um, scientific procedures to evaluate flavors of beer objectively? <laughs> Thanks, my turn, Jason. It's a, it's a fairly complex uh, way of analysing uh, beer because beer contains lots of flavours and volatiles. So uh, we do have formal training in terms of looking at firstly the defects in beer, like diacetyl, acetaldehyde, DMS, H2S, and so forth. Uh, but also, big one. It can be both chemical and sensory. So we actually can uh, back it up uh, analytically and then train our tasters in terms of detecting threshold levels of those particular attributes. So we actually, uh, as brewers, we get trained to taste uh, the defects and the falsity uh, uh, beer flavor profiles. And uh, you know we have a dedicated person at, at the brewery that uh, gives us uh, blind samples to actually detect uh, spike samples of H2S, isoamyl acetone and so forth for us to be able to uh, uh, keep up our sensory uh, uh, capabilities of detecting those type of flavours. Okay, so we, we've, we've seen a shift over, over time from the broad acre crops grown in Australia being uh, essentially publicly funded through uh, a combination of farmer levies, government contributions. Um, we've seen the development of endpoint royalties charged directly to farmers. So uh, typically whether you're growing a new wheat, barley, canola variety, there's a fee charged to the farmer uh, as a royalty. and Overall, as an industry, we're now seeing uh, you know, breeding being in a, in a commercial space and uh, essentially breeding programs are funded out of that royalty stream. So if they're successful, their varieties are successful, um, you know, they're, they receive more income. Uh, if they're not relevant, well, they don't. So every individual variety is a commercial product? No. Uh, uh, no, well, it, it, it is. What would be the spend? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer that. Well, that might be a good time to wrap up. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've heard uh, a fascinating presentation tonight from Jason and John uh, on the wonders of uh, barley breeding and beer production. Please join me in thanking them very much. <laughs> it's wine, I'm afraid. But, uh, but I, I do recommend when you go home that uh, 
you all uh, have a good uh, Cooper's Pale Ale and, and uh, make sure that it, uh, it's from barley bred by the University of Adelaide, please. Uh, can I just uh, let you know that uh, the next Research Tuesday will be on the 10th of June and that will be an Indigenous Health Forum with panellists discussing latest research to tackle the ongoing profound health inequalities in Indigenous communities compared to non-Indigenous. So that prom promises to be a fascinating even evening. Thank you so much for coming and good night.